Welcome to the Disrupt Your Career podcast, brought to you by Claire Harbour and Antoine Tirin. We're passionate about helping everyone find fulfillment in their work life. We believe that big, messy, uncharted career changes are inevitable. And it's up to you to decide. Will you take control and disrupt? Or allow yourself to be disrupted? We wrote the book about it. And now we share here our conversations with other thinkers in this crucial area. Settle down and get ready to listen to this dose of wisdom. So on this episode of the Disrupt Your Career podcast, I am delighted to be welcoming Mosongo Mukwa. He is a seasoned executive, bestseller author, leadership coach, and business consultant. And Mosongo specializes in developing strategies that help companies grow in today's extremely rapidly evolving global business landscape. And his book, Be a Leader of Significance, published last year, is something we're going to be talking about later. Mosongo, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm grateful to be on your show. We're very glad to have you. Let's start, as we always do, with your career journey. You've been through decades of global management in your career, working in technical and general management positions in the materials industry, as well as in consulting. You also more recently become an author. Why don't you share with us how this career has unfolded? And we always love to understand what role design and serendipity have played in your journey, as well as to understand something about your proudest moments and the moments of challenge. I came into this uh, leadership in a way <laughs> by accident. So I just finished my PhD. I took a job with a specialty chemical company, and I was really looking forward to uh, you know, settling into a career as a research scientist. I was dreaming of developing patterns, developing new products, uh, going around the world giving technical presentation on behalf of the company and so on. But what happened is that not long after I started, the head of R&D uh, called me into a one-on-one -on -one meeting and he told me, he said, well, uh, we would like to make you uh, a manager. So uh, he said, I've spoken with other managers. They think you'll be a good fit for the role. We would like for you to build a research organization. I hesitated. I said, well, uh, you know, in my mind, that wasn't in my plan. <laughs> yeah, I've never married people before. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a bit caught off guard, I, I might say, by this. And I remember that time I told him, I said, uh, I'm not too sure if I'm ready to do this. Because at that time, I was thinking, well, let me start a career as a research scientist, and then I can probably progress. And then uh, obviously, I would like one day to run my own organization and so on. But this thing really came all of a sudden, right after my research activity. He told me, say, you'll be fine. So suddenly I was a brand new manager with quote unquote, no management experience. I would have to figure things out. So that's really how my career started. So a few people helped me uh, fill in various gaps, but I was more or less on my own. That's what it was. But it's a thought that my growth and comfort, they would never coexist. To get that growth, you need to be put in somewhat of out of your comfort zone, if you think. And I think, uh, we learned the most in life is probably when we were in a risky situation. So one year led to uh, two, uh, two, three, and eventually a long and very uh, interesting uh, career. I've never regretted being uh, in a leadership role. Give us some context. You've had, you know, regional, global roles. What sort of geographies have you actually lived and worked in beyond just the business travel? It would be Interesting, I think, to get a grasp on just how global your career has been. In one of the positions, I was based in the U.S. Uh, we were manufacturing uh, polymer, servicing the ink and packaging people. Managing a group based in the U.S., I also had a group based in the Netherlands. Those are the two groups. But then I was still based in the U.S. And then I took a role with another company, and that particular company we were subsidiary of uh, a Japanese uh, conglomerate. That took me, obviously, uh, regularly a uh, business trip to Japan. But for that role, I was still based in the U.S. and then uh, managing a global organization. So a team in the U.S., a uh, team in Brazil, team in uh, Mexico. Uh, so that's what I have, a team in Brazil, a team in Mexico, and a team in Austria. I transitioned and I took a role uh, in India. So here I am moving to India. 
And then I spent actually uh, almost 10 years there. But then based in the U.S., I took another assignment in India. So I went there to India, building an organization in India and uh, an organization in Belgium. And then now I'm running this Hathaway Advanced Material. So I guess we can assert that you are culturally and geographically flexible, and you've learned how to succeed in all kinds of different situations. As you think about all the different leaders and clients that you've worked with over the years, what would you say are the top two or three leadership lessons that you've learned working alongside these extraordinary people? Number one, all people are created equal. Human beings are the same regardless of the geography. The reason I'm saying that is because, number one, what people are looking for, they're looking for a sense of belonging. For example, uh, I remember this uh, scientist in the U.S. by the coffee machine. I asked him, uh, what was it there in our company that really kept him, you know, uh, what is it? What you like in this place? And I thought he was going to tell me that, uh, oh, our great chemistry, we're doing great projects and so on. No, he told me, he said, what I like here is that uh, during last time, I can go and play ping pong. I can <laughs> go and ping pong with other colleagues. Uh, <laughs> and so on, we get to talk and so on. So that sense of affiliation was extremely important. And uh, the other thing that people are look for is uh, that psychological safety. I remember this uh, marketing employee. So she uh, got transferred into my group. And uh, she was related to me that when she started uh, the role as a marketing manager, she realized that uh, she was no longer invited in meetings. There were rumors that uh, work was maybe not up to par, and so on and so on. And then eventually she got transferred into my group. And uh, during the discussion, I did ask her, I said, why did you not go and confront this individual and ask, why am I no longer uh, invited in meetings? She said, well, because I did not even feel safe asking that question. She said, I felt invisible. Wow. This is something that I've noticed across the geography. Last example is that uh, obviously people are looking to feel valued. But now, to be valued is not always by being given an assignment, project, or, or whatnot. But uh, sometimes, uh, us as a leader, just some simple gesture. For example, this uh, manager uh, in India, he said, uh, you know, in India, they tend to always refer to people, sir, sir, sir. He said that the other day when we, you were passing by my office, you told me, you said, hey, uh, I did not forget you. I know I've not spoken to you for a long time, but I haven't forgotten you. He later on told me that that simple gesture, that simple comment made him feel good, you know, and he was able to carry on the day with a great deal of energy because he felt in a way value. But most of all, uh, Claire, Human connection is at the basis of really leadership. The reason I'm saying that is because when you put emotional connection, that foundation, then you begin to discover what people are really capable of. I love the fact that your conclusion is that in the end, it's about humans working with humans, making products for humans, which they sell for profit of humans. And that's really it. It's so very basic. And yet... The amount of pontification that goes on around it is extraordinary. Anyway, okay, thank you for those insights. That's lovely. Now, let's jump forward and talk about your transition from being a corporate employee, which you were for an awfully long time, to being a consultant and author. It's a big change. We love it when people have big changes to talk about, but they're usually challenging as well as exciting. Tell us about how you experienced that transition. When, when I started my career, I did not really have a mentor, uh, so to speak, or, or a coach in a way. Huh? That's something that I did not really get. But most of all, what I've realized uh, is that uh, over the years, when I meet with people who have worked with me, either under me or alongside with me, when we are talking about the past, we rarely talk about that we have increased market share or... Uh, because of us, the stock price uh, grew because we had that uh, you know, exciting product on the market. But really what we always seem to talk is really we talk about experiences, experiences that we remember, the experience that went through while developing something, the experience that went through because we did uh, some particular exercise within the group. 
So really what that meant is that those products or market share, they were the outcome of something more profound, which is really the transformation of individual. And then as I was reflecting about that, I thought, well, let me uh, perhaps uh, capture some of my thoughts and share it with people there. So the book, Flair, is really uh, about advocating for uh, impactful uh, leadership. So that's really what it is. I'm hoping that those uh, in a leadership uh, role, they could take some uh, hints there, some tips. I have some practices there and so on. Stories that they could relate. Practices that they, tomorrow they can implement. Writing a book really uh, forced me uh, into uh, introspection, an emotional uh, exploration, the willingness to confront uh, my own personal fears, because I also have to talk about some of my challenges there as well. The book also helped me rediscover my passion for my work, helping people develop and grow. I think a book also, in a way, uh, transcends time. Eh? So, uh, you know, it's a way of uh, leaving a legacy, so to speak. That's a very convincing argument. Thank you. So your book contains a number of wonderful stories and all kinds of pieces of advice and guidance. A lot of it about making an impact, leaving a legacy. If you were to boil down the main ideas of the book, what would they be? How could we share with the audience enough that they get a picture and not quite enough so that they go off and buy it? There are many junctures during the day where we meet people. And what I'm saying is that uh, let's use that as an opportunity to get to know other people. So it's not just uh, to see someone and say, oh, uh, how is it going? And then you walk away. Or essentially, you're telling the I really don't have the time <laughs> to talk to you, <laughs> and so on. Rather than asking, how is the project going? Perhaps you might want to ask, uh, is there any surprise today on that project? There are some bright spots into uh, in your team, some stars there, you know? So because by doing that, then you're beginning to connect with others, and particularly if you're a leader, you're beginning to slowly uh, build uh, that environment of trust, and if you do that and you have created an environment of trust, then you are able to go deeper into people's aspirations, beginning to know what are their fear, what they, they love to do, and so on. When you are asking a good question, you are adopting a posture of humility. You are confessing that you don't know and you want to learn. We all want to think we are smart enough <laughs> to try to imagine what's going on in other people's head. But really, the evidence shows that this does not work. So people are just too different from one another, too complicated. So if I'm going to get to know you, uh, it's not because I have this magical ability to peek into your soul, but rather it's because I have the skills, the skills of asking the sort of questions that will give you a chance uh, to tell me more about who you are. Beautiful. So it sounds like what you're describing are these things that you call in the book the moments that build confidence. And I'm wondering if you could just share maybe one little gem, one personal experience of where one small moment had a significant impact on you and your own leadership journey. In the beginning of my organization, this head of the department used to have, uh, on a, at a Friday meeting, at a Friday meeting, rather than us discussing projects, uh, he used to assign us an uh, article to read. I used to be frustrated because, you know, we come in Friday meeting, let's talk about our project we're going and so on. Over the years, what I've realized is that at the end of the day, our work is not just about projects, but it's really about a number of those uh, sub things. At the time, I did not realize it. But then looking back, I uh, realized we will read uh, something on community, discussing project. And I'm saying that was uh, a moment of, of significance because... Uh, little by little, I began to realize that actually, as his direct report, that he was valuing us in terms of our own capability to develop because he could see something there. When he would meet some of the board members, uh, you know, board members, they would fly from all over the world, they would come there and so on. Rather than him dispatching a driver to go and pick them up, he would ask one of us. Uh, and for whatever reason, and in most cases, he used to choose me. Then I would go drive airport and pick this uh, senior person there, a board member, and then this individual would be actually surprised that I'm coming to pick him rather than having a driver coming there. Did that allow for us to have a bit of conversation in the car 
maybe one hour drive sometimes two in the car to know and so on. And that also gave that uh, appreciation from the court member to this young fellow the year, who is he? You know? Those were significant for me because it allowed me to realize perhaps some of the skills and capabilities I had, which that I was not aware that I had, but I was never aware of communicating. I began to develop communication with senior people. I learned how to carry myself in front of them. In the book, you talk about the importance of enabling others to lead. And of course, we could talk about all kinds of different angles of this, but I'm interested in the idea that you could share about how organizations, how they can create an environment where every individual feels empowered to take on leadership roles, perhaps with more confidence and more readiness than you had back at that first time when it was asked of you. So you need to create that environment of trust, which means that you have to engage. You have to engage, which means that you as a leader, you need to be visible. So there is no point in you being in your office. The door is closed. So the message you're giving essentially to others that don't come and disturb me. I'm too busy. So you need to authentically connect with others. Because really when they see the real you, then uh, you become more approachable and uh, that also reinforces that connection. As you're interacting with them, you need to have that persistent curiosity. It's not meet with them once and then you carry that conversation and then a year later you come again. And so you have to have that persistent curiosity. Because if you don't establish that, then you are not in a position of talking about bigger things. So those are small incremental persistent curiosity and which then open up that environment where people are feeling safe, then people are really beginning to express themselves and so on. And then once you do that, then now you can have a conversation with people because now you have created a space where people now they feel open to express themselves. They may tell stories about great experiences they may have had. And then uh, this is the types of comfort that really uh, is required. Our job is really uh, to create opportunities uh, for others, huh? because uh, we are really motivated by the desire to live an organization in better shape than we found it. So you need now to create opportunities for others, for them to develop and grow. Fantastic. Well, let's talk a bit about development. At its most basic, development is about enabling people to fulfill their potential. How do you strike a balance between guiding somebody and allowing them the freedom to discover and grow on their own? You have a guiding and then allowing them to do you'll see there are two groups of people. Some will come and seek opportunity, but then others, they may not necessarily come, but you may pull them in and give them the opportunity, and then all of a sudden they discover that they had these capabilities that they did not have before. To find that balance, really, there is no magic formula. It really depends on the individual. But first of all, the individual has to want to be developed. And it could be uncomfortable uh, at times. So I looked at the development as a journey of exploration, and which is maybe punctuated by moments of discovery. So while on that journey, they have to maintain that growth mindset, take charge of their development. In some instances, they might come and seek your advice, but you as a leader of the organization, you need to be able to coach them and challenge them. Because by coaching them, by challenging them, to force them into a reflective mode, then they can really internalize the whole process they're going through, learnings and things of that sort. That's really what I would say. There is one technical fellow that I sent to Japan to learn some uh, technology there for him to bring it back. By all accounts, he was not seen. Uh, he was not seen as a star by others in the organization, but I felt that we have to give him a chance and see what he's capable. So after spending uh, three months there, he came back, he brought the technology, uh, he became an expert, great deal of energy, uh, he began to uh, teach people in manufacturing, marketing, what this technology was all about, and so on. It was not really the result of his own goal. But once he became aware uh, of what was going on in him, he began to realize that the experience resonated uh, with the previous things that he has enjoyed doing in the past. Typically, I like people when they're given an assignment to give them the opportunity of uh, defining 
how they're going to go about carrying that particular project or that particular task. Because then they would own it. And then they would own it. And then over the course of the activities, provide the feedback when it is required, but give them a great deal for independence because they have to learn huh, through their own mistake, through their own tribulations and so on. You have to guide them. And then if needs be, and you feel like they need a hand to help them, then you can volunteer your help, go there, help them, and then you withdraw yourself and you let them continue. Sometimes say that all those things is like a laboratory. You can like you're doing a series of experiments. That's a lovely image, Masongo. I'm wondering what is in your laboratory for the rest of the year? What exciting things are coming up for you? Running this Hathaway Advanced Materials, doing that, we are working on an exciting project with other companies. So we are trying to uh, partner to get more financing for uh, some of our technologies. So that one is exciting. Doing some business consulting uh, here to support small business owners. So, so that one is exciting. That's actually something I enjoy a great deal, coaching others. So on the personal level, if I may, uh, my youngest daughter is expecting her first baby here soon. So Congratulations. That's wonderful. You're going to have a rich and intense year. That's beautiful. Well, Songo, thank you so much for joining me today. The conversation has been wide ranging. It's been fascinating. Thank you for bringing your energy and for sharing all your wonderful leadership tips. This was great. I appreciate you having me on your show. I enjoyed very much our conversation. I hope your listener also uh, will enjoy it as well. I'm sure they will. I have no doubt of it at all. We hope you enjoyed hearing from this month's guest as much as we did. Do go and check out our work on disrupt-your-career.com and come back soon. Thank you.